Hello, and welcome to Pragmatic Live, Pragmatic Institute's webinar and podcast series where we tackle the biggest challenges facing today's product teams. I'm Steve Johnson, and I'm the head of products here at Pragmatic Institute. If you're not familiar with us, Pragmatic Institute has been training companies for years on how to be truly market and data-driven. We provide techniques for listening to the market and gathering market facts and key data, and then using that information to shape strategies and drive execution. And we've been doing this for over 25 years. Eric, do you want to pop in for a moment and say uh, a little bit about yourself and about your company? Sure, sure. I'd love to. Uh, my name is Eric Bodick. I'm one of the founders of Pendo and, and now our chief evangelist. So I'm kind of a, a mix of a product person and a marketing person by trade, having owned both of those organizations uh, in past lives. Um, a little bit on Pendo really quick, since we're going to cover a little bit more detail later, but Pendo is about delivering products. Uh, <laughs> Pendo is about helping their customers, helping you uh, deliver products your customers love. Uh, we do that through one complete product cloud. Um, a little bit more about me. If you like what you hear today, uh, I also have a podcast called Product Love. You can get it on iTunes. And uh, Steve was on there in the past. April Dunford, I think, was the latest episode uh, where she talks about positioning. So I invite you to check it out. It's Product Love on iTunes. Great. You know, every month in our webinar series, our goal is to dive into one of the activities on our framework and bring to it insights, best practices, and stories uh, from the trenches. And we're really happy today to have Eric with us. In this seminar, we're going to look at product profitability and question whether product profitability is, in fact, the wrong metric for certain stages of your success. And so we're going to look at that as we go along. But uh, I, I'm often asked in my role, people will say, you know, Steve, shouldn't product managers be bonused or compensated or measured on profit and loss? And, you know, that sounds like a really good idea um, until they until I really talk it out. And so I'll say, so, you know, if they're responsible for profit and loss, that means that they're authorized to uh, reject contracts for excessive discounting or look for alternative development or marketing channels if there's insufficient resources internally. And by the time I'm done with that sentence, uh, the, the, whoever asked the question has turned com, you know, completely pale. And then it's just like, oh my gosh, the, no, I didn't mean that. So what does it mean to measure profitability or other metrics as we go along? And this is one of the boxes on the pragmatic marketing frame, I'm sorry, the pragmatic framework uh, around the area of product profitability. This is the, the chart that we've used for years to articulate a lot of the activities and methods in the realm of product. But uh, Eric, why don't you talk about this graphic? <laughs> this graphic. You know, it's funny finding these old pictures of Amazon and Mr. Bezos there, right? But uh, the disclaimer from this is, is obviously we're, we're trying to talk about things in an hour and we don't know all the details of your business. So we're gonna give you a lot of thoughts on metrics, but metrics do change as you grow. I mean, what was important to uh, Jeff in the beginning there, uh, when he had that very beautiful sign, uh, is very different than the Jeff of today, right? And just as products grow, companies grow, and, and metrics are affected by that. So take everything we say with a grain of salt. Well done. And, you know, if you think about the product life cycle, there are different requirements or different things to measure as we move through this path. And uh, I find this is a very helpful way about thinking about where your product is. Yeah, I would agree with you. I mean, in the first one I find particularly interesting, Steve, when we talk about getting to product market fit, uh, I think that's, that's an area of challenge for, you know, all startups. Uh, and a lot of them, this is where they break down. This is where the companies don't quite make it. Uh, I think, you know, when you... When you go back, right, Mark Andreessen first was quoted as kind of defining what product market fit is, and I believe he defined it as being good in a market with a product that can satisfy that market. And when we think about metrics, like what metrics are important here? Well, obviously, product profitability would be horrible here. Uh, maybe you give some cursory thought to things like margin, but when you start to talk about what the perfect metrics are, it's a little hard in this stage, I think. I, and I wish there was a perfect product market fit metric, but, you know, I'll, I'll give you a crack at what I think my top ones are. And the first one is this idea of 
asking customers how they would feel if they could never if they could no longer use or never use your product uh, and getting answers to that either through customer interviews or ideally through things in app via surveys or email uh, and I think you can get a gauge if if 40% of them are saying they would run screaming through the streets, uh, then you might really have something there. Um, so got to get to that, got to get that number of, you know, I can't live without it up over that 40% number. And I think that's a good metric that maybe you're getting into that product market fit. Now, that's very dependent on the number of customers, right, Steve? It's not like, hey, you, you, your mom and three of your friends all say, I can't, can't live without it. And the two people that uh, you don't know that are strangers you know, are like, eh. So very dependent on the number of customers and very dependent on the market and business, right? So product market fit for a social media company, right? Can't just be 10 customers that say they can't live without it. Um, where, you know, if you're selling to large banks, it could be, could be maybe 10 customers, maybe even less. Um, the well, other at this stage, you're also investing a lot of money in the development and perhaps even the marketing. Um, so profitability is not really an option at this point, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Profitability is not an option. Really, you're using, you know, indicators of future profitability, whether it's I can never, I, I couldn't live without this, a good group of early customers that are saying that, whether it's sentiment, like positive customer feedback, things like NPS. And then, you know, repeat usage is a good proxy too, much more than growth, right? Because growth, growth can be bad here, right, Steve? I'm sorry? I was going to say, I think growth can even be bad here. Don't you oh, think? good point. Yeah, you, uh, what is it? I have a friend in North Carolina who says, you know, good marketing or good adoption can, destro can destroy a mediocre product. Right? Suddenly a lot of people know how bad it is. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. I and mean, before you get to that bit, if you have all these customers dragging you in other directions, it can be a distraction from really establishing that product market fit. You could have thousands of customers saying your product's eh, it's pretty good, you know, we're willing to use it right now because it's cheap, you're just starting to get an adoption, you aren't really charging as much as you probably will be when you're growing or optimizing your revenue. So uh, there's a possibility you, your resources, your thoughts, your, your very scarce resources, your very scarce time, your very scarce thoughts are distracted uh, because of concentrating on things like growing. Mm -hmm, totally. I, I, th I actually think here the goal is not profitability uh, or even necessarily revenue. It's learning. You know, we're, we're trying to figure out, is this the right product? Is this the right market? Have we identified the right personas? Um, and, you know, as you look at, you know, some of the early adopters, you find yourself going, wow, there are like 17 different personas here. And I remember I, I, I went to work for a startup, which was a wonderful experience. And the president was trying to, you know, convince me to come on board. And he said, yeah, we're, we're the leader in 12 different markets. And I went, wait a minute, you're like a $4 million company. <laughs> How can you be a leader? And he's like, yeah, we have one or two customers in these different 12 markets. So I don't know that that's really, you know, a dominant player yet, but they were, they were still struggling to find product market fit. Who, was, who were the ones that said, as you put it, you know, I, if, if you took this, this product away from me, my, my business would fall apart? Yeah, I, I think that's probably the best answer, best set of data you can get here. You know, repeat usage, like I said, helps with that. But, you know, you want customers to have it. Yeah. Um, so if, in my case, if I had 30 or 40 customers and most of them were willing to be a reference, I consider that a pretty good metric. So you're a believer in this idea of product market fit, right, Steve? There's oh, yeah. a question about whether it exists in some minds. Well, we talk about it in a different way at Pragmatic. You know, we see so many companies building products that people ought to want. And it seems really smart when we're in the office. You know, wouldn't it be great if we added, you know, Bluetooth to pretty much anything? Uh, and then we get it out into the market and people go, yeah, as you said, you know, it's like, yeah, that's okay. That's interesting. And it, everyone in the office is super excited. But when we take it into the market, they're like, I don't understand this. You know, this, this seems to be solving a problem I don't have. And certainly in our classes, we strongly emphasize product managers and product marketing people getting firsthand experience in the market to hear from the customer 
what they really think, not going through the telephone game of customer support or sales teams saying, you know, this is what we're hearing. Yeah, absolutely. So should we move on to making products that you already did? Hey, let's, Indeed. You're like in front of me there. Uh, <laughs> stickiness, you know, this is, this is interesting, right? You have product market fit and you really want to make sure your product sticks. You don't want to be, you know, like a pet rock or something from the standpoint of like, oh, people love it and then they're gone. Uh, so now it's about making that product stick. So you're not just a, a viral video or a fad, but you're, you're the potential of being something in the long run. Um, it, it's interesting because that it, it's almost defined in this, in this slide stick, right? So mm -hmm. stickiness is this great indicator of, of future repeat usage. But can I, can I go on a rant here for a second on sure. stickiness, Steve? <laughs> So let me let me talk about that for a second because I was approached the other day. I was speaking out in LA, and someone came up to me and was like, "I'm trying to get my DAU to MAU count higher." And I'm like, "For those of you who don't know what that is, daily uh, active users, so monthly as a percentage of monthly active users, the ratio there." And I'm like, well, "Do you want to?" And he looked at me and was like, "I hadn't thought about that." I was like, "Oh, so it's you know." And, and the idea here is he thought about it for a little while and he's like, "No, I don't really want daily users. I'd rather have weekly users." I was like, well, think about that as your stickiness metric. And so you hear a lot about people like, oh, let's drive our daily active users and, mm -hmm. and make sure we have everyone coming in all the time to use our product. But that's not always in the user's best interest. So I think you need to have stickiness that takes the user into account. And a great example of this is tax software to make it all mm -hmm. like, you know, easy to understand. So if I'm selling tax software, I probably only want people using my software at most in an ideal case one day a year. Like go in there, figure out all the stuff I need to do, publish my, you know, submit my taxes, pay my money, et cetera. Uh, and then from there, I pr I'm hoping I don't have to go back in the software at all till next year. And mm -hmm. maybe in an ideal world, I actually never go in. Like ADP sends all my information directly to this tax software who just takes care of everything. Expensify feeds that stuff in. You know, everything comes from my bank account. It's just all automatic. I mean, that would be amazing. So I, I think stickiness is one of those metrics that's super important, and it, it's one that you really want here. Uh, but at the same time, it's one that can kind of lead you down the wrong path if you don't think of it in the in the eyes of the user, the the person buying or yeah. using your software. And in the and in the eyes of of your business model, I mean, you know, I, as you were telling the story about taxes, I was thinking of expense report software, um, which seems it must be really loved by the accountant because I can't find anyone who travels who loves their expense reporting software. But I certainly don't use it every day. You know, I take one trip every other week. I do it, you know, as soon as I get home, but I don't use it daily and you wouldn't want me to. Um, but certainly in terms of making the product stick and in, in, in the case of, well, in case of expense reporting, it's like I'm, I'm already stuck. You know, I don't have a choice. Um, but if there's enough riot among the user base, you suddenly find, you know, IT saying, well, gosh, maybe we need to find a different tool that doesn't make Steve whine all the time. Um, so there, you know, part of making part of making the product stick is creating a product that that all the users like. And it seems to me that in, you know, using ERP software and using, um, you know, bill payment software, so uh, stuff like that, it feels like it's built for the IT staff or the accounting staff, as opposed to, you know, real people who, who actually use it. Yeah, I think that's changed a lot. Obviously, we're seeing like this consumerization of the enterprise, which I think well, is true. great. Uh, so the more we get interfaces like, you know, our iPhone or our Teslas, or I don't have a Tesla, I wish I did. But if I did, it has a great interface, you know, <laughs> we get more of that in business software, we're all happier, right? Right. Well, yeah. And I think today we are all, everyone, exposed to consumer products, and we expect that same experience with our enterprise product. Um, before we leave this point, what, what marketing program would you implement for making products stick? Yeah. In fact, I'll touch on the last one, so like getting product marketing fit, too, since uh, I know that came up in the Q&A here. Um, you know, to getting to product market fit, I think here, you know, you're going after and you're acquiring early customers. And I think a lot of those should be high touch, right? You want to be spending a lot of time with your customers and learning how they're using the software and what makes them need it, right? What makes them run 
screaming through the streets if you took it away from them. Mm -hmm. um, so high touch marketing is great there. Things like events, uh, you know, even if you're getting leads via digital, really reach out to them. You know, look look at them as those early adopters that you want to get as much information from as you do, uh, you know, usage. And then when you start thinking about making things sticky, now I think you're starting to scale more of your, your marketing spend a little bit and how you're acquiring customers. Uh, I don't think you want to, you know, push fully into growth mode because you still have some of the same issues you had before. Like, let's make sure this product not only has product market fit, but is sticky too before we really push out the growth engines. Uh, so I think, you know, you want to spend more time understanding where they get value, having these conversations with them. And you might do that through automated things like, you know, looking what funnels, you know, looking at funnel analysis, like what steps they go through in your product, what features they use, what they don't use, um, managing paths, like seeing where they start in your product, where they end, how much time they spend in different areas. So there's good uh, product analytics you can use. Uh, but purely on the marketing side, I think here you're just kind of experimenting with different channels, trying to acquire customers uh, and see what customers, well, see what customers are retained uh, based upon the channels that they're acquired through. And maybe sent a better way is like, hey, if someone's coming in through digital, uh, is the retention rate a lot higher than people coming through events? And it's probably the other way around, right? Uh, but start tracking that kind of stuff because you know, as a product manager, another little mini rant here, I think retention is a huge thing and making products stick is really all about retention in the long run. And, you know, it's not enough as, as a leader of product uh, to get people to use my product. I got to get them repeatedly using my product and paying for it on an ongoing basis, whether that's the next month or the next year, depending upon my contracts. And I think that's really a metric that product managers should be graded on that retention aspect. And then as we get into later stages, marketing, you know, marketing becomes a lot more complex, I think. Yeah, great. You know, there, um, I still, there's one vendor I work with that uh, has a monthly newsletter. I, I still like, you know, good old fashioned, you know, HTML formatted simple newsletters. Actually, it may just be a text only newsletter, but it's interesting the way he does it is, is this vendor um, has three articles in every newsletter. One is for uh, newbies, you know, people who are, well, actually pre-newbies, if that's such a thing, uh, people who are still kicking tires. You know, why should you be doing, you know, whatever his product does? And then the second article is for people who are just starting to use the product. And then the third article is for power users. And so in terms of, you know, making the product stick, what he's doing in this newsletter is, is growing customers, which is our next point, but also within the, you know, the, the customer base, the newbies and the experienced people, you know, here's a trick on using our product to do either a very simple thing or a very complex thing. And I always find, no, uh, I'd say about half the time I, I am clicking on the newbie thing. It was like, I, gosh, I really didn't know the software would do that um, because, you know, I tend to lean on the power side of things, but this, you know, typically... About half the time, the, the newbie article is interesting to me as well. And I, I think that's a, a, a really simple technique that maybe we overlook nowadays the, of getting the product to stick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, we're getting a lot of questions too, Steve. Do you want to – should we take a few more before we jump? Sure. So here's one from Jen. She's, she's saying, can you try to figure out product market fit by getting the product, if, if it's already created, out there ASAP to gauge feedback, uh, see who's buying it, et cetera. Um, do you want to take that one? Oh, shoot. <laughs> I can get it. So the answer to that, Jen, is hell yes. Hell yeah. <laughs> I'm a big fan of getting stuff out early in people's hands. Uh, especially if uh, you're not even charging for it. Like, I, I think there's this early period, you have a product, you have something you think has value, just give it to some customers. You know, tell them that you're going to charge them for it later, uh, but get some early feedback. See what they love about it. See what they can't live without. And maybe look at doubling down as you build that product and on those areas that they can't live without because those kind of key differentiators, those uh, things that they don't get from your competitors or from other solutions in the marketplace, those are really powerful. And those end up locking in the love of the customer in the long term. True. Uh, you know, I have a friend um, who, who uses the phrase a lot. He, he uses, um, he says, 
you got to nail it before you scale it. And I, it sure seems to me that we go straight from, hey, we built something, let's, let's ramp up our revenue engine. And we skip this whole making the product stick and, or even, you know, getting to market product fit because we go straight to growing customers. Uh, but we got to nail it first. And absolutely, I, um, I believe in the MVP concept and getting a, uh, well, when I think of MVP, I'm thinking of minimum viable prototype, not necessarily a minimum viable product. Uh, but yeah, getting in the hands of people and getting real feedback is, you know, the essence of Agile. You know, maybe we should have just stopped on market fit. We could probably uh, have a whole webinar on that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to take one more before we move on? I'm, I'm uh, sure. On fit. Well, you know, let me throw this one at you. Um, Carly asks, how do these change when the product is a widget versus software? Oh, wow. You know, um, it, it definitely does change because you have this issue of actually physically producing a device, right? So it's a little bit harder, like I said earlier, like get stuff out, get it out early, get it out often, get feedback. And I would still say the same thing, uh, but it has to be done in a much more measured approach, right? You can't be, you know, constantly creating new devices, uh, assuming it's some kind of device, say like an iPhone. Uh, as is your widget, or even worse, a car. The more expensive the device is, the, the more you have to start looking at other metric, you know, other ways to get uh, that early product market fit. You have to start betting more early, right? Uh, it's riskier. Uh, the cheaper the product is, the, the easier it is to do to get things, you know, early prototypes in people's hands, even if they're ugly and maybe the the form factor isn't great, but you know, test as much as you can as you go. If it's a large, expensive product, look at, you know, how you can test and get feedback of components of that product. Uh, but the more it moves from digital, which is the world I love, because in some ways it's a lot easier, uh, to uh, larger and larger devices, like, say, a space station, uh, the harder and harder it is to get product out early. Definitely. You know, I'm reminded, this is an old story, I don't know if you remember the Palm Pilot, uh, but originally... The, the original prototype for the Palm Pilot was a piece of wood, and he carried it around in his pocket, and I think he had drawn on it, you know, what he thought the user interface was going to be, and he would just be walking down the street, and he'd so, just show it to people. You know, he, here I am at the PTA meeting. Let me show you the thing we're working on. Um, and so, it, you know, it doesn't have to be a working prototype, but when, when I talk about product, I'm not always, I'm not always talking about software. You know, I, I consider, you know, services to be a product. I mean, here at Pragmatic, all of our training courses and our consulting offerings are all productized um, so that we can, you know, we, we can build it once and deliver it many times. Um, so whether we're talking to software or anything else, uh, in, in the case of like a new service or a new training course, you know, we get, try to, you know, we start by getting to product market fit. Uh, then we make sure we've got a good set of references that are that are using the product going forward, and then we're ready to start growing our customer base. I, I, back I, to that I, next point. Using the space station one, right? I imagine just like that little wood palm pilot. They probably built a little space station or wood in the future that they just see how people live in and interact and move through. Uh, before putting something up into space. So well, good point. Mock up, right? Well, they build a space suit and throw you in the pool first. You know, if, yeah. you're, if it leaks in the pool, it's going to leak worse in space. Yeah, I imagine leaking is bad. In that case. Leaking is bad. So let's talk about growing customers. Yeah, so I, I think this is, you know, this is important. Once you got a, a sticky product, once you have some fed, it's all about scale here. And, and I think... You know, today's market rewards ARR growth if we're talking about software companies and growth in general, if we're talking about, you know, companies in general. Growth seems to be the big metric at the venture capital community that they look at. Um, and there's different aspects to that. There's some leading indicators like NPS, uh, uh, net promoter score that can point to growth. Uh, people will be heavily analyzing things like retention and churn uh, because actually retention, expansion and churn those different components have more of an impact on your future ARR growth uh, than new customer acquisition. So you'll see a lot, you know, of focus here on growth. You know, payback periods and things like that are important, especially if you're constrained by cash. So, you know, if you only have a certain amount of capital, 
it becomes very difficult if you have a, a long payback period. Uh, similarly, cost of acquiring customers becomes important dependent on, uh, and, and that really drives payback period. Uh, what other thoughts do you have, Steve? So let me jump back to, we had a couple other questions I want to catch. Give Steve a, a second to see if we can get him back here. So one of the ones that Derek asked, you know, kind of stepping back is, is thinking about financial estimates, right? And if you go back to my first comment uh, when I talked to about how Andreessen defined product market fit, all the way from there moving forward, you know, there's a, the concept of a good market, right? So what is a good market? Uh, a good market comes down to this financial side, right? How big is the market? Is the total addressable market big enough? Um, you know, are you able to differentiate enough either by doing something new in the marketplace or having a new market relatively greenfield altogether that the total addressable market is uh, compelling enough that product market fit really matters? So arguably, you can have product market fit even if the market's bad, and I, I would kind of you know, disagree with Mark on that standpoint. You can still have product market fit, but you don't really want to unless there's a marketplace that's big enough, right? If you're spending uh, 10, 20, 30 million dollars to build a product that you know the 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 largest you're ever going to see is a couple million dollars a year out of, it's probably not worth doing. So when you start thinking about you know what Derek asked about ROI and other financial estimates, they're important that you get involved early on uh, and start looking at a total addressable market, how big it is, and then also look at that as you continue to grow. You know it might be that acquiring customers in this growth stage is really expensive. Uh, and that might affect how you look at the value of this marketplace. So that's important to think about, right, um, as part of this. And if we want to jump forward a little, uh, Sarah, to slide uh, to the slide on, you know, optimizing revenue, that would be great. I'll jump up into that one. Eric, go ahead. You have uh, control of the slides now. Oh, cool. Even better. Mm-hmm. And we have, let me just, we have Steve on. I'm just trying to find, uh, trying to promote him to presenter. <laughs> so make him make make talk again. It's always good. So, yes. you know, now we're talking about, you know, after you've grown and you've scaled and you've gotten to the point where, say, you're a leader in an established market that's relatively big, you know, it comes down to optimizing revenue. Uh, and I look at, you know, ARR growth is still important here. If you look at the public markets, uh, you know, even some of the bigger companies, and we'll go through some of the benchmarks later, um, you know, ARR growth is still highly valued. Uh, profitability now becomes a little bit more valued as we get to this stage, right? Um, you see what the rule of 40, and I'll explain a little bit more about that for public companies, but profitability and growth are both important at this point if you're at the public company size. If you're not at the public company size, it's still mostly about growth. You should be looking at things too, like uh, LTV to CAC ratios, like how valuable your long-term value of customers, you know, based upon how much it costs to acquire them is very important. That ratio becomes very important at this point. Uh, retention and churn, in particular, how they affect ARR growth, but really retention and churn are probably more important than uh, new customer acquisition to some extent, uh, especially if you're a software company. Uh, because there's more money to be made on kind of the long term uh, by retaining customers and signing new ones that drop off pretty quickly. Uh, so retention becomes a really, really important part of uh, your your revenue mix at this point. Hey, look, we got Steve back. Maybe. <laughs> when you are back, Steve, just let me know. So a couple of questions we had. Uh, Brendan was talking, was asking about, you know, using additional attributes when, cal when calculating cost to acquire customers, uh, you know, things like, uh, I believe, level of customization to sell the product or to sell a standard product. And I would definitely look at that, you know, when, when I'm looking at, if I'm an investor, I'm thinking about how out of box is the sale, right? And if there's a huge level of customization per customer, either I'm pulling that out of gross margin and definitely tracking that or I'm looking at that customization as part of the cost of acquiring that customer, which, particular, which could have a huge impact on that long-term value to CAC ratio or the payback period. Um, and while it might be, not be gap associated to think about like, oh, you know, 
post-sale customization of a standard product. Uh, I shouldn't put that in pre-sale. It's really important when you think about kind of the new SaaS metrics, because if you're customizing every single standard product or a lot of them, um, you know, really that's going to impact your ability to scale quickly uh, and it's going to impact your ability to optimize revenues. And it seems to me that that's the issue associated with so many companies that the development team thinks that they're in a standard product business and the sales team thinks we're in the customization business. And either one of those businesses is fine, but not at the same time. <laughs> Absolutely. And there's a question too, Steve, about just finding resources, uh, including a summary slide that includes product metrics by phase or jumping up. Barry was asking that. So that would be a great thing for us to provide. Maybe we could provide a little, well, before we send out these slides, we'll add a little summary slide in the end that just lists some of the metrics that we talked about in each of these phases. That's a great ad, Barry. Thank you. Good idea. Um, we had one more question. I'll give this to you, Steve. You know, can you explain or clarify what we mean by ARR growth? <laughs> uh, gosh, aren't most people doing like monthly or daily, weekly? Yeah, and then that's technically MRR growth. I mean, yeah, okay. by but, ARR, we mean like, I'll just answer it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working my way to it, but go ahead. So for ARR, what we mean is annual reoccurring revenues. So sorry about not defining that a little bit earlier. So we're talking about annual reoccurring revenue, thinking that you know you have reoccurring revenue contracts. If you're still charging like an annual fee and maintenance, uh, you know it obviously affects this number, but you can think of it as you know annual revenue as a whole. Uh, but you want to see that number going you know up and to the right. The great thing about you know renewable contracts, SaaS contracts, you know uh, reoccurring revenue contracts is that they're a lot more predictable uh, than if you're charging someone up front uh, with maybe a trailing maintenance of say 10 to 20 percent. So right. that clarifies what we mean by ARR: it's annual reoccurring revenue and the growth of your annual reoccurring revenue. Right. The metric we're and it's about it's kind of scary if you're still if you're doing billing on an annual basis because you know the bill comes people go holy moly this is a lot whereas on a monthly basis it doesn't seem quite so much i mean if if i'm paying 60 dollars a month for something um that is a different mental model i think than if i'm paying 600 dollars a year and i go wow am i really getting 600 dollars worth of value so it's almost like the the annual approach of uh, licensing ends up kind of forcing the customer every year to make a renewal decision as opposed to, oh, the bill came, you know, hey, I can handle that $60 or I can handle that $200. Yeah. Well, I still have control, don't I? So let's talk about extending life. Do you want to leave this one off, uh, Steve? Um, yeah, you know, as you get towards the end of, you know, this life cycle, you start looking at how do we optimize not just revenue here, but how do we now optimize profit? And I've got a couple of slides coming that, that speak to it in a different way. But um, fundamentally, it's like by extending the life, you're looking for uh, maybe new niches that you have not been able to service before or um, uh, expanding the usage within an account. But mostly, it's you get into um, cutting costs. And, you know, developers and salespeople hate this part, but, you know, this is an older product where it's phasing out, where we're looking at lower annual purchase each year. So it's not worth investing a lot of money in, but we can extend it just a little bit by um, cutting back on our development costs and our support costs and then looking for other geographies or other vertical markets that could use the product as it currently exists. And so we can get just a little extra oomph out of it before we go into our ending it phase. Yeah, I, I think that's good. If I was going to add anything or summarize maybe, profitability, big important metric here because you're yeah. really just trying to get as much as you can from this product before we get to this next phase. So costs, you want to keep them down, margins, you want to keep up, and then you want to get retention, keep retention as high as you can for as long as you can because mm -hmm. you're extending the life of your product longer. Because once right. the extension starts fading away, you're coming to this, you know, next slide, which is 
you know, when do you make the decision to end it, Steve? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's kind of simple math, you know, when the revenue is uh, you're not able to get the revenue of, above the, the cost line, then it's, it's time to shut it down. But it's a business decision, you know, and yet for a lot of people, it's very emotional. You know, the developers who've been working on it, they're like, hey, I love this thing, you know, and the, there are certain customers who love it. And either in the extended phase or the ending phase, you can keep it going a little bit longer as long as you increase your prices. I mean, there may be some customers who say, I know you're discontinuing it, but we'll pay you, you know, 10 times more in annual maintenance if you'll just keep, you know, keep operating system and browser uh, support going. So there are some, uh, if you can make the trade-off that we're making enough money to pay for this resource, um, you can extend the life, but at some point, it's just a business decision. You know, it's, I know everybody apparently in the financial system loved IE6, but, you know, at some point, Microsoft said, we're done. Got to get off. <laughs> Got to go. Got to go. And, you know, I'm sure the banks came around and went, dude, I'll pay you more. And they're like, no, this is opportunity cost now. And the big trick for ending a product is to stop paying commissions to the sales team. Yeah, I mean, that definitely stops the new customers coming on board. Absolutely. So, the, the retention. Should we, should we be putting bugs in a product for uh, an old product to get customers to stop you? Should we introduce bugs? You are, you're evil. You're evil. No, I think those, the, the, by this point, it's like the thing should be pretty bug free, except for, you know, new operating systems and browsers. But uh, I don't know that I'd really recommend adding bugs. That is interesting. You're at, you know, you're a bank you're using IE 6.8, right? And 6.9 gets out. It's like upgraded with bugs. <laughs> move to eight, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, the things we think about. I know, I know. I don't recommend, yeah. by the way, I do not recommend making your products worse just so you can make it easier to end the life. But there is this concern, like you mentioned, that comes up. You have that one big customer that uses it, and maybe they use like a ton of your other products, and they're like, please don't end of life this. And you're like, but we have to. Yeah, we're not in the custom business anymore. You know, if you've only got one or two customers, and uh, it's it's really hard to do, though. I mean, it, it's 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 hard to disappoint your best customer, but there's the opportunity cost of if I pulled this team and put them on something uh, way at the beginning of this curve, we'd be better off. And and so this is an interesting way of thinking about it. The Alchemy of Growth is a wonderful article uh, that's been around for quite a while. And it, it says, you know, we look at the products we have now, our current set of products, that's what we can see in the current horizon. Um, those should be optimized for profit. So we're reducing our cost of goods sold. We're reducing our cost of development. We're trying to, you know, reduce the cost of supporting. Um, and then most of our marketing spend and our development spend goes into these Horizon 2 products. What's coming next? And those we typically optimize for growth, not necessarily revenue growth, but uh, adoption as well. And it may be in the early parts of a, a next-gen product, you'd rather have more new customers than having more new revenue. Um, and at some point, you know, in as you move from next-gen to current, you know, you transition away from uh, wild growth into profitable growth. Uh, but the, the horizon that interests me the most as a, as a product management kind of person is Horizon 3 is optimized for learning. These are the products that um, are discontinuous innovation. You know, they're uh, a new technology for us. It's what's going on right now with, you know, AI and machine learning and IoT, that it's not so much that we're trying to get growth or profit at this point. We're trying to learn. Uh, here's new technology for us. And uh, then once you've learned a little bit, you can then start moving it backwards from Horizon 3 to Horizon 2 to Horizon 1. And then beyond, if there is such a thing beyond Horizon 3, it's all about validating product market fit. And I think one of the challenges that we see with kind of unbridled innovation or even with design thinking, which is wonderful, is they tend to start with the innovation as opposed to starting with the market problem, which, you know, for those of us who have gone through a pragmatic class know that we're really passionate about that. And another way of saying it is on the next slide, 
um, you know, you come up with a new product idea and, you know, to test it, you do a, a minimum viable prototype and you get a little success, a little feedback, and you make a, a slightly bigger prototype. And then later on you build, you know, uh, and the actual release one and release one, one, release one, two, you know, whatever. And ultimately, you know, you've got release two and maybe you say, okay, now the market demand is starting to taper off. And so we need to take the excess profits from release two and put them on the next MVP, which is on the next slide. And if you're the team working on release two, you're pretty annoyed that all of your excess profits are going to the next thing. But that's how business works. You know, we go through these cycles where at some point we say the market isn't growing for this product anymore. We need to reinvest. And wasn't that the Apple II to the, you know, Mac where there's, Apple II is just pumping out money, invested in the Macintosh. Indeed. And as I recall the story, um, Steve Jobs saw what um, – oh, shoot, I should have remembered his name. Um, well, Steve Jobs uh, kind of took over the Macintosh project, and he did it by moving, literally moving the Mac team to a new building. And sending to the Apple II people, y'all keep doing whatever it is you're doing, but we're going to do the next generation over here. And so while Apple II was working on the Apple III, you know, Steve and his merry band were working on the Macintosh that became the future of the company. And the argument there in like the innovator solution or the innovation dilemma is you can't use the same resources because they're always going to be pulled into today's product in, uh, and not be able to work on tomorrow's product. Yeah, I think that's a very important point when you think about it. I mean, if you try to split people's resources across today's and tomorrow's, uh, it's a very difficult thing. It's almost like wearing a, a product manager and product owner hat. <laughs> right. We won't go down that. Uh, yes, let's not. So we have a question from uh, either it's Coralie or Corali or something else. I'm I, sorry if I mispronounce your name. Uh, but she asked, where do you think end users' feedback will be most critical in the product life cycle? And my answer to that is in the first two stages, in particular when you're trying to find product market fit and also when you're getting that stickiness. That's where it's super critical. Now, it's important throughout, maybe less important when you're uh, end of life a product. But it's definitely it's still important in the growth and the optimizing revenue phase and definitely important when you're looking at product line extensions. But I'd say the most important part, uh, if I had to pick one, is the early stage. Because mm -hmm. if you That's don't great. take the feedback and get it right, your product's never going to get to the later stages. Absolutely. And, you know, if you've done this for a while, you start realizing, you know, by, you know, stage three or four in our chart, um, at some point you've pretty much heard them all. You know, it's just a question of actually getting the resource to do the things. I mean, you've always got a backlog that is greater than your resource base. Um, but after a while, in terms of feedback, it's like, do, you know, I've heard this uh, I've heard this one plenty of times, and it just hasn't bubbled up to the top of our list yet. Yeah, and another question from Guy. Uh, he asked, if you're headed for the exit, can you entertain selling the business to your key customer who wants it extended? Uh, I think he's thinking about the product exit, you know, mm -hmm. ending the life. And <laughs> what do you think about that? I, th I think it's a great idea. I think it's brilliant. Yeah. Um, you know, um, Jeff Moore wrote about something similar when he was talking about understanding what is core to your business. And it's, it's a topic I'm really passionate about because it seems a lot of the businesses that I encounter don't seem to know whether they're a software company or a services company or a sales company or what. And, so Jeff was talking about, you know, finding your core and anything that isn't should be outsourced or sold. And one of the examples he used was there was some internal function, you know, accounting or, you know, payroll or something. And it was, it was something only this one company used. And what they did is they went to the head of that department and said, we're going to discontinue this as an internal function. And what we'd like to do, fund you and be your first customer if you'll go off and just make this an independent business and we'll be your first five years. And this team stayed together. They went across the street. They continued to service the company, but they did it on an outsourcing model. 
That's definitely cool. Yeah, I would I'd say look for that opportunity. If you're end of lifeing a product, if there's a way you could sell it to a customer that really desperately needs it, it's a great thing to do. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of questions and we're running up into the last 10 minutes or so. Uh, you know, Steve and I are, I'm sure, happy to answer questions offline too. I'm just Eric, E-R-I-C, uh, at pendo.io. So feel free to shoot me any questions you have afterwards that I don't get to. Uh, again, it's Eric, E-R-I-C, at pendo.io. And I'm sure Pragmatic will be sending out the recording, which is one of the questions. I uh, can also uh, answer any questions uh, that you might think of both now and later. Uh, anything you want to add to that, Steve? Or should we move on to some growth benchmarks? Yeah, let's look at the growth benchmarks. There are a lot of good questions here, and I, I will uh, um, we'll, we'll follow up with them in, in some way. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, <laughs> one of those guys that's like, oh, it's great you talk to me about metrics, but talk to me about, like, what best in class is doing. So I think it's interesting. You know, a lot of the venture capitalists do some great job looking at benchmarks. Um, this comes from Bessemer, Bessemer Venture Partners. They do an annual kind of state of the cloud, uh, which I recommend reading. You can Google state of the cloud and you can find this. Um, but it's really interesting to see how quickly some companies, you can see years down across the horizontal access and ARR going up. Uh, you can see how quickly some of these companies, you know, got there. Uh, it's crazy. Um, you know, and, and I'm fortunate at Pendo, we're kind of, uh, we're in the middle of that chart there. So trying to see if maybe we can, uh, we're not going to beat Slack to 100 million. I don't know many companies that will, but we'll see right. if, uh, how close we could get to the next guy. So, Indeed. and this gives an easier kind of way to, to look at that. So if you look at the, the venture, the Bessemer Venture Partners Growth Benchmark, you know, and we're starting at a million in ARR. So you can see what's good, better, and best. Uh, to 10, it's four years for good versus two to best. For 100, it's 10 years for good and five years to best. So just kind of great guidelines for where you are. Uh, and you can kind of map yourself against some of the best in class as you're going through kind of these, these or as you're going through these growth metrics. Mm -hmm. another, another interesting metric is retention metrics. And I think, you know, if you think about one base metric for retention, it's really hard because who you sell to the size of the company really affects retention a lot. Uh, so Bessemer also did a great job here, you know, looking at, at retention for different segments uh, and, and what's best. So, you know, at the small business, you know, seeing 70% growth retention and 80 to 100% net retention is, is awesome. Versus the enterprise, your retention should be a lot higher than small business. Your price points are going to be higher uh, and your retention should be higher. Now, it's a lot more expensive to sell to the enterprise than to small business. Uh, but retention and contract values should be significantly higher there. Uh, and, you know, for those who are wondering, well, what's 120% retention? When you look at net retention, now you're also looking at expansion revenue as a factor of that. So you can have over 100%. If you, say, have 100% of your customers stay and 20% of them, you know, increase their revenue by, you know, X dollars, you're going to be over that 100%, right? Uh, so that's how you can get over 100% there. This is interesting from a product perspective. This is a, a slide from Battery. So Battery does something called, uh, I believe it's called the State of Software. Um, and they did one for 2019. Uh, this is a slide from that report. Uh, but it also uses Pendo data, which I think is really cool. Our data science team put together a list of uh, an analysis of how often features are used. And we found that you know, 80% of features are rarely or never used, which is kind of crazy. Uh, and from that, you can look at things like product efficiency. So if you are able to take your features that you have in your product and through analytics, you know, look at what's rarely used, what's never used, what's frequently, what's moderately used, these would be the averages here. So you can, you can look at yourself against that benchmark. And if most of your, or, or if less than 80% of your features are rarely or never used, you're, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, compared to the norm. Moving on, here's another interesting benchmark to look against. And we didn't talk about, you know, benchmarking ARR, which again is annual reoccurring revenue uh, against employee, but it's a great benchmark as you're exiting the growth phase and moving into optimizing. Um, and even at the lower areas of maturity, as you can see in this graph, you can see what the expectations are. 
So early on, you know, when you're over investing, say we're in the growth phase, this is post product market fit still, uh, because we're talking about companies that are probably over 10 million in ARR, uh, but we're talking about growth now. You're seeing things that, you know, over investing, you're hopefully getting close to 100K ARR per employee. The investing phase now, you know, 100 to 200. The break even phase, which would correlate, you know, to optimizing revenue. You should be seeing two to 300 uh, per employee. And then sustained profit, you know, here is where the, the end of the optimizing revenue and the beginning of the extending life, you should be seeing significantly more. And as you get into extend the life, you're really trying to get as much money from these product lines as you can. Now, again, these numbers are based upon the battery software um, study. So we're looking at software companies and skewed to, you know, reoccurring revenue software companies. But gives you, if you're in that industry, a good baseline for where you should be in ARR per employee based upon where you are in the maturity curve. You know, you can also kind of reverse engineer the maturity curve from these metrics. You know, if you look and you see, you know, hey, I'm doing consulting or training with a company that's got 200 million per uh, employee, then you've, you've got a, an idea of where they are in their life cycle. You know, does that make sense? You can reverse engineer where Absolutely. they are. Or where they should be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. Absolutely. And then for those of you who are at public companies, you look at public company benchmarks, and again, this is from Battery, and they do great work here. Um, you, you start hearing about, you know, pro rewarding growth and profitability. Now, in the early stage of venture money, it's really about growth, it's not about profitability at all. But as people move to this public company market, it's rewarding both growth and profitability. And you're going to see higher multiples for those companies that have high growth mixed with profitability. And probably an even better way to define that is this next slide, uh, where this idea of the rule of 40, when you're adding up growth and profitability, you're hopefully looking at this 40. That was that line in the last slide here. Mm -hmm. Let's move to the last slide. That was that line here in this last slide is this 40. Um, so the cool thing is if you segment this up, what you'll notice is that even though, you know, 40 is where you want to be, the companies that are rewarded more are the ones that have the higher growth, not necessarily the higher profitability. So even in public companies, you're seeing growth trumps profitability. But if you look at your overall growth, uh, your, your growth multiples uh, or your growth rate, I should say, uh, plus your profitability rate, uh, you want to get to at least that 40 number. And that's where you're going to see great multiples uh, for your company as a whole. Woo, right. We're down to five minutes, Steve. Okay. So we talked a lot about metrics today. Uh, Pendo produced a cool little report called 10 KPIs. Uh, you'll be able to click through it when we send out the, the post webinar email. But if you can't wait, you can search 10 KPIs Pendo on Google, and I think it'll be the first or second link there. I would think. I know we've covered a lot of questions as we've gone, Steve, so we'll probably skip over this, right, and jump into uh, yeah. resources. So again, second area here. If you want more resources from Pendo, you can Google Pendo resources or Pendo resource. It'll be your first link, I'm sure. Uh, and check out some of the resources. You can actually find the 10 KPIs right through there. Um, and it will be in the follow on email too. And then over to you. Okay. Well, every month we take on a new box in uh, the Pragmatic Framework, and this month we talked about product profitability and other metrics, and next month we're going to talk about how to grow and launch a subscription business as we look at our launch box. Uh, we have a longtime friend of Pragmatic who will be leading that session on July 18th, so no doubt we'll be sending you information about that after our session today. So I want to thank Eric for uh, having a great session and keeping things going when our host was off in the ether. Um, but it looked like it all worked out in the end. And, you know, as you think about KPIs, you know, it really just helps to step back and say, what am I trying to accomplish here? You know, and I, I think the, the stages that we talked about today give us a lot of insight on what we should be counting, what we should be measuring. And it's not always just money. 
Uh, okay, that does it for this edition of Pragmatic Live. Thanks for joining us, and have a great rest of the week.